Hello, everyone, and welcome to my last lecture in my series about King Arthur and the Arthur Cycle. And this one, as promised, will be about the question of whether there was a real or historical King Arthur behind the mythology. So as we've already talked about all through the Middle Ages, poets, bards, scholars spoke about a Dark Age British king who battled against Saxons and Romans and magical pigs and all sorts of adversaries to protect the island of Great Britain before he was betrayed and fell from power. And all through the medieval era, from the 800s until the 1400s, it was basically taken for granted that there was some real historical Arthur, even if not every story told about him was taken seriously by everyone. It was simply considered a settled fact that there was such a person. This presumption was called into question and even debunked during the Renaissance by this humanist quest to trace and uncover the earliest verifiable historical sources for stories and legends. And just as Lorenzo Valla debunked the donation of Constantine in the 1400s, so in the English Renaissance, Arthur was put on trial and rejected as a legitimate historical figure. But since the 19th century, with this great revival of interest in Arthur and the matter of Britain, there has been a growing desire to uncover evidence or to piece together plausible theories as to whom a real historical Arthur might have been. And you could say that there has been something of a quest for a historical Arthur, in many ways parallel to the contemporaneous quest for a historical Jesus, which I've talked about before. But one glaring fact that we have to acknowledge right up front, although there are those similarities and parallels, we have to acknowledge that the evidence for a historical Arthur is much, much weaker than the evidence for other disputed historical figures, including Jesus. The documents that attest to Arthur and his career come from significantly later they provide far less verifiable information. In fact, although one can make a case for a historical Arthur, and I'll discuss how some people have done that, it's always going to be a far weaker case than for other historical figures, even including those like Jesus who were obscure within their own lifetime. And if Arthur is to be rehabilitated and rediscovered as a real historical personage, it will necessarily depend on new discoveries of new earlier or contemporaneous evidence, such as happened with some other figures, for instance, the biblical David, whose existence has been corroborated by new recent archaeological finds. So the current scholarly consensus about Arthur leans pretty strongly towards the notion that he was not a real historical personage, but that the claims made about him through the centuries were basically unreliable folkloric stories or political propaganda cobbled together into a mythological body. Nonetheless, let's look first at some of the argument in favor of a historical Arthur. What are some of the central reasons that many scholars from the Victorian age on up to today do argue that there is at least some kernel of truth and that there was some important Dark Age Romano-British leader who forms the original basis or inspiration for the legend of Arthur? So some scholars, such as, for instance, Dorsey Armstrong at Purdue University, argue that the original Arthur legends are a case of euhemism, whereby a real person becomes mythologized. Stories about them are exaggerated to the point where they might even become a demigod or a god. And there were even ancient scholars who theorized 
that this is where all mythology about gods and heroes originally came from, from the gradual embellishment and transformation of stories about real persons. So what would make some researchers think that this is where the Arthur story came from and that there was a real person at the beginning and at the core of the Arthur mythology? Well, firstly, number one, if we look at the specific historical context where Arthur supposedly lived and fought, it was in the middle of the Dark Age, about the late 5th or early 6th century. All through those centuries, the Saxons seem to have advanced and seized control of ever greater sections of Britain, beginning along the southeastern coast and then advancing westward across the island. They were apparently almost unstoppable and continued to expand their dominions until Anglo-Saxon kingdoms controlled basically all of what we now know as England. But based on archaeological evidence and some textual evidence, it seems as if around the middle of the Dark Age there was a halt. Roughly around the year 500, the Saxons stopped this inexorable westward advance, and for a period of maybe a few decades, a kind of stationary iron curtain appeared, cutting north-south through the island, or at least through the portion that we now know as England and southern Scotland, and there was a sort of stalemate for some period of time between these Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to the east and surviving Celto-Roman states and chiefdoms to the west. We don't have a clear explanation of why this advance seems to have halted. And this raises the question of whether some person or group managed to unify these Celto-Roman statelets along the western side of Britain and lead a more effective opposition to the Anglo-Saxon advance. In that case, we seem to have, as some scholars have said, we have an Arthur-shaped hole in the history of the Dark Age and of this contention between Anglo-Saxons and Celts. And in this way, it seems to stand to reason that the figure spoken of and written of as Arthur, this formidable British warrior leader, might have been exactly the person that we're looking for. And while it might seem at first blush as if it's unlikely that one person could have somehow led and coordinated a kind of pan-Celtic opposition to the Anglo-Saxons, it is actually conceivable that a leader could have taken advantage of two assets effectively against the Anglo-Saxons. One is horses and superior horsemanship which might have been inherited from the Roman age and Roman cavalry, and understanding of the landscape, particularly the Roman road system, which still would have existed in the 5th and 6th centuries. And hence, it seems to account for this otherwise strange political and military course of events if someone had brought together cavalry forces using the Roman roads to move quickly and hold off Anglo-Saxon advances all through that middle corridor of Britain. So this is the basic kind of historical slot in which it seems we might be able to place Arthur. Secondly, there are written accounts dating to the early Middle Ages that put Arthur into this basic role and refer to him as exactly the sort of leader we're looking for. I'll just go back and point to three of them that I discussed before in the first lecture. Firstly, the earliest known reference that might be to this Arthur leader is in a Welsh poem called Egododden, which dates from the late 500s, so not long after this putative historical Arthur probably lived. And this poem, Egododden, discusses the careers and exploits of two Romano-British warrior leaders up in the northeastern part of Britain, around what's now Edinburgh and the Scottish borders. The poem describes them as very fierce and effective warriors, but they had shortcomings and eventually were defeated. And one line 
in this poem describes one of these Romano-British warrior chieftains and says that while he had great prowess and knew how to slay his enemies, nonetheless he was no Arthur. So from this one single line, it seems as if already in the 6th century, people just knew and took for granted the fact that there was a great warrior leader, the great epitome, you could say, of warriors who was called Arthur. And one could simply invoke that name and the audience would know who you were talking about. The next definite reference to Arthur and the first one that actually describes his career and who he was is in the Historia Britannum, a history of the Britons written in Latin in Wales in the early 800s. And the Historia Britannum, as I talked about before, describes Arthur as a great military commander who won a long string of victories against the Anglo-Saxons, culminating with the battle at Mons Badonis, or Mount Badon. And about a century or so after the Historia Britannum, another Welsh author writing in Latin compiled the Annales Cambriae, a chronicle of important events in Wales. And this is the first document to give specific dates to events involving Arthur. And it claims that Arthur won this victory at Mons Badonis in the year 516, and then he was defeated and overthrown in 537. He seems to fit very nicely and conveniently into that Arthur-shaped hole, right? How did the Celto-Romans hold off the Anglo-Saxon advance in those decades in the early 500s? So you can see if we put together the context, which is roughly reconstructed from the surviving Dark Age records, and compare it against those early written references, it seems as if Arthur makes sense as a real historical person and that he is able to answer historical questions. The third reason, after the Dark Age context and the early written accounts, the third reason that some scholars believe or argue that there was a historical Arthur is that there have been some archaeological finds at certain sites that seem to fit with or corroborate the written and oral accounts about Arthur from the Middle Ages. And some have even theorized that particular archaeological sites in Britain can be identified with locations in the Arthur mythology. But this is very disputed and controversial. It's a still changing and evolving field of knowledge. But as with so many other historical questions that I've talked about over and over again, a lot of conclusions that have been based upon examination of written documents are now being overturned or at least radically questioned by archaeology. But I will leave that subject till a bit later to examine what these sites are and what they do or don't reveal. A fourth reason that some scholars point to to support the notion of a historical Arthur is that we can see in the surviving chronicles and records from the 6th century, we can see that the name Arthur emerged rather suddenly in the mid-500s as a common name, particularly in royal families and specifically for firstborn sons or crown princes who are the heirs apparent to take up the throne. And the appearance of this name seems to have come up first in the Cornwall and Wales area, that sort of southwestern zone of Britain, which was Celtic dominated, of course. And then it spread generation by generation northward, up along the western side of Britain to the Isle of Man and Dalriada, that Gaelic kingdom up in Scotland, and then crossed over to Ireland and spread down from Northern Ireland into the south. So it sort of circled around the Irish Sea. We don't know why or how the name Arthur suddenly appeared in the sort of roster of common names for royal princes. But it seems to stand to reason, if we compare this against the later written accounts of the Arthur, 
the famous Arthur and who he was and what he did, it does seem to stand to reason that these royal families of Celtic statelets around the Irish Sea were naming their sons after some admired or heroic leader who may be the same person then referred to in these later historical accounts, and for that matter, the same person alluded to in E. Gododin. So these clues seem to add up, and moreover, the fact that the name Arthur first appears down in the Wales and Cornwall area in the southwestern corner of Britain seems to fit together with the notion that that was the original historical Arthur's home base and that he may have been a commander or chieftain of some kind in a Celtic state like perhaps Dumnonia, which was the area in the southwest that's now Cornwall and Devon and Somerset. A fifth point that some scholars and also lay people use to argue for historical Arthur is that some particular candidate that can be found in the documented historical record of the time fits and can be pointed to as the real Arthur. Now, I'm not going to get deeply into those theories and arguments. For one thing, they're all fairly weak. The links between the legendary Arthur and these historical candidates are all pretty attenuated, but I'll just briefly address them to see how they fit into this debate on both sides. So one figure that has gained a certain number of followers as the putative real Arthur is a Roman general named Lucius Artorius Castus, who evidently was stationed in Britain in the 180s AD during the Roman rule, and who commanded units of Roman cavalry, and his cavalry were mainly Sarmatian from steppe lands off on the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire, and then were brought under Lucius Artorius Castus's command into Britain to fight against opponents in the middle and northern parts of the island, particularly Picts. So some supporters of Lucius Artorius Castus have pointed to some similarities and parallels between the chivalric tales of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and Sarmatian mythology and folklore from the Black Sea steppe lands. And they theorize that it was those Sarmatian cavalry around Lucius Artorius Castus in Britain who first conceived and propagated these stories that then were recorded later in the Middle Ages. And of course, the main link that originally hinted that there was some connection between this Roman general and King Arthur is the name Artorius, which is a somewhat common Latin family name. And Arthur scholars, whether or not they subscribe to this theory or see any connection to this Roman cavalry commander, they do generally agree that that is the most likely original root of the name Arthur. We don't know exactly where that name first came from and how it came about, but probably it is a sort of Welsh or Britonic Celtic translation of the Roman surname Artorius. So that is one candidate, Lucius Artorius Castus. A second one is a prince called Arthur Mac Aden, who was the crown prince of Dalriada, that seacoast kingdom along the western side of what's now Scotland, a Gaelic Celtic kingdom. Arthur Mac Aden was the crown prince of Dalriada in the late 500s, and he and his brother reportedly died in battle against Picts, their main opponent to the east. So some have argued that that brief line that we mentioned in Igodaden is actually referring to Arthur Mac Aden, who maybe had just recently died in battle and was seen as kind of a great warrior hero. And the various legends and stories about a supposed King Arthur were built up around that original germ. A third candidate, which has some fairly prominent supporters, is a leader of Britons who lived in the late 400s, so a bit earlier 
and who is called in the surviving records Riothamus. And it seems that name Riothamus is probably actually a formal title. And in the Breton or Welsh dialect that it comes from, it might be a superlative, meaning greatest king or king of kings. So we don't know much in detail about Riothamus, but it seems that he probably was a kind of supreme leader of some sort of Celto-Roman alliance or confederation during that early period after the Roman withdrawal and during the first Anglo-Saxon invasion. There are two documents that make reference to Riothamus and that give us all the recorded information we have about this very mysterious figure. One document is a letter penned by a Roman official, probably down in southeastern Gaul, around what's now Provence, where there was still some Roman control. And this letter is addressed to Riothamus and asks him to help a subject who has lost his slaves and wants to get them back. The one other document that makes reference to Riothamus is Jordanus's History of the Goths. So you might remember in my lecture about the Dark Age from a few months ago, I referred to Jordanus, this Gothic historian who lived in Constantinople and wrote a grand Latin history of his people. And there are passages in his History of the Goths where he refers to Riothamus as a commander of Britons who came by sea landed in southwestern Gaul around what's now Bordeaux and brought his troops to try to support the Romans against the Goths, but was unsuccessful. So that's all the historical reference we have to Riothamus, but it seems as if it might fit with Geoffrey of Monmouth's description of Arthur and his career, which he wrote in the 1100s, where he describes Arthur as a king of Britons who not only ruled over and protected Great Britain, but also crossed the sea and made conquests on the continent, particularly in Gaul. Furthermore, if you consider the similarity in sounds, is it possible that Riothamus might be related to Arthur, that maybe one name somehow morphed into the other? But either way you look at it, this theory of Riothamus as the original prototype for Arthur is favored by Dorsey Armstrong, a, an Arthur scholar at Purdue University, whom I think I mentioned before. Nonetheless, regardless of these pet theories about various candidates, the basic hypothesis of what we might call Arthur historicists can be summed up basically as this. There was a Romano-British leader based probably in southwestern Britain, maybe in the Principality of Domnonia, who united Celto-Roman people against the Saxons, who won a significant victory at a place called Baden, maybe around the year 500 or a bit later, and who then over time came to be seen as a heroic king with supernatural powers and connections to sorcery and the other world. So as far as it goes, this might seem like a fairly reasonable argument, maybe even a strong argument. But what are some of the problems and objections that critics of the historical Arthur hypothesis have advanced? What are the, you might say, mythicist counterpoints? Well, again, to go one by one down the list. Firstly, the idea that the Dark Age context requires or points to the existence of some effective leader who countered the Anglo-Saxon advance. Well, the main problem with this argument should be pretty clear if you've heard the lecture I did a few weeks ago about Britain during the Dark Age. And that is that, in fact, it seems from archaeology and other new sources that the Saxon advance into Britain was actually pretty peaceful. There is little to no evidence of warfare or of Celto-Roman society being violently attacked and overrun 
Even though that is the way some of the early written accounts describe it, it doesn't seem as if that's really how it happened. It was actually more of a small and gradual migration and settling of Germanic migrants in the island. And the Anglo-Saxon spread into the island was probably not really a spread of people. It doesn't seem, for example, from the genetics as if there was a mass invasion of Germanic people across the territory, but more it was a movement of practices and styles. Things like elaborate ceremonial burials with extensive grave goods. Those practices seem to have spread bit by bit and been adopted region by region. Likewise, Germanic languages became a common shared language and spread across much of the island not by the movement of people, but by the movement of words, you might say. So we don't necessarily need to speak of some masterful Britonic military commander who stopped the Anglo-Saxons, but rather we just have to account for why certain Anglo-Saxon practices or technologies or rituals only spread so far and then stopped, for a while at least, around the middle of Great Britain. And even if it was a military halt, even if we still hold on to this idea that the Anglo-Saxons were advancing militarily and then for some time were stopped around the middle axis of Britain, it could be explained just by the geography, that they were simply getting to a point where the terrain was more difficult and Saxon military techniques perhaps were not as effective now that they were reaching the more rugged areas of Western Britain. So for all of these reasons, we might still say that the existence of a historical Arthur is plausible, but it is not required, at least not in this particular way. There is no Arthur-shaped hole in the history of the Dark Age. And if we are to advance the idea that there was a historical King Arthur, we need more specific corroborating evidence beyond just circumstantial. So, of course, the main evidence that any historian can point to supporting the notion of an Arthur is those early medieval written accounts, which I talked about before, beginning with Egododin, the Historia Britannum, and the Annales Cambriae. But... In the scale of history, those written accounts are really not very early. Even that earliest little snippet reference in Ego Dodden is from after Arthur would have already lived and died, probably a generation or two later. So that already right there makes it historically unreliable. And even beyond that, we do not have any original manuscripts from the Dark Age of this poem. All we have is manuscript copies that were produced several hundred years later, and we cannot actually know for certain that that line about Arthur is in the original, or if it could have been added in, interpolated in, hundreds of years later, after Arthur had become a figure of myth and legend, against which to compare all warriors and leaders. One point in favor of it being in the original, dating back to the 6th century, is that it fits into the rhyme scheme. So that, you know, maybe suggests that it was in there all along, but again, it might have been a rewrite or a revision. So even that earliest source is really not all that strong, and if we do take it seriously as an early reference dating back to the 6th century, Nonetheless, it doesn't tell us anything about Arthur. It doesn't say anything further about who he was, what he did, where he lived, or when. Just he was a guy who fought really well. Then there's the Historia Britannum from the 9th century, which discusses Arthur's career and the battles that he won. That's dated to 829 or 830 AD, hence about 300 years after Arthur's supposed career. That makes it a very dubious source. And furthermore, it could be politically motivated. The leaders, the elites of Wales in the 9th century wanted to provide a Christian and Celtic hero to serve as a sort of symbol for the Welsh resistance against Mercia and English domination. 
So we can't just take this discussion of Arthur at face value either. The big question then when it comes to Historia Britannum is did the author, when we think the author probably was a monk named Nennius, could Nennius have been drawing on earlier sources and records that came from closer to the actual time of Arthur? There are suggestions, if you look into the details of the text, there are hints suggesting that Nennius might have been drawing on an earlier Welsh source, particularly a Welsh bardic poem or song describing Arthur. For instance, it seems there's a mistranslation, what appears to be a mistranslation from Welsh to Latin. And that is in the reference in the Historia that says that Arthur went into a particular battle bearing the sign of St. Mary on his shoulders. Now, that's a really strange thing to say, right? That's not something you often see in any medieval manuscript, a warrior carrying a sign on his shoulders. It's much more normal to put your sign or insignia on your shield, where it's most visible. And scholars have theorized that this is a mistranslation, where some translator along the way mistook the Latin word iscuit, meaning shield, for the Welsh word isguid, which is shoulders. So this suggests that somewhere along the way there was a Welsh source which shifted over maybe in pieces or several different times into Latin, and someone confused what a word like iscuit or isguid was referring to. And there are clues of that then in Historia Britannum. Another important fact about the passage in Historia Britannum is that it lists Arthur's 12 battles, and there seems to be a symbolic significance to the series of 12. And if you look at the names of the sites, it gives a location or a site for each battle, and the names of the battles fall into two rhyming series. The first cluster end in a ras sound, like saras, and then the second series all end in an own sound, like Badon for Mount Baden, and also one site is referred to simply as the City of the Legion, and Legion again ends in that same O-N sound. So hence, it seems as if probably this list of battles that Nennius puts into his Historia was taken from a bardic song or poem, which was composed to rhyme and to be recited from memory. So one can take this as an apparent point in favor of the historicity of these claims, that the Historia is drawing on some older source in the vernacular language. But as others have pointed out, such as Nicholas Higgum, whom I'll discuss later, this does not mean that that source that Nennius was drawing from was itself historically reliable. Generals do not fight series of rhyming battles. That does not really happen. And so whatever information Nennius was maybe taking from this song or poem, we can't take that seriously as a reliable source. It was probably already myth or legend that had been revised in some form. So all that that tells us at the very best is just that some notion of a warrior maybe called Arthur who fought battles against the Saxons was already known and in circulation before the Historia Britannum in 830. But there's really nothing more that we can trust from that putative source. Another possible point in favor of the credibility of the Historia Britannum is that the big final battle is referred to as Mount Baden. And there is good reason to think that that is a real event. And that's because Gildas's History of the Destruction of Britain, which was written somewhere around 250 or so years earlier, back in the 500s, also makes reference to a major battle at Mount Baden, and specifically a Celto-Roman victory against Saxons at Mount Baden. So it does seem pretty likely that at least that one battle was a real historical event. However, as many scholars have pointed out in frustration, 
Gildas's account, which is far, far closer in time to the real events, makes no mention of Arthur. It does refer to Mount Baden, but it doesn't discuss who commanded troops at that battle. So does this mean that maybe Historia Britannum was just picking up a real historical event and slotting it into this narrative about Arthur, when in fact there's no real connection? Maybe. Or maybe alternatively, you could say Gildas simply wasn't interested in military matters and didn't consider it important enough to name who were the particular battle commanders on either side of a battle. He was a scholar, probably a Christian monk, and he was kind of sick of Britain and British politics and was on his way to leaving anyway. So maybe he just didn't see it as important or valuable to his story. Thirdly, as I said before, there are archaeological finds and investigations that could be seen to bear out some claims in the Arthur legends. But these are only significant if you first give some credence to those later Arthur legends that connect him to sites such as Tintagel or Avalon or Camelot. It can be seen in a way as begging the question or circular reasoning to say, well, we think we have discovered some place that we can call the real Avalon, and therefore that corroborates the notion of Arthur. Uh, You first have to show that there was an Arthur to be connected to the site. So even if you take these discoveries seriously and hypothesize that they bear some relation to places and events referred to in the Arthur mythology, that still doesn't necessarily mean that there was a historical Arthur to link them all together around one personage. Fourthly, the appearance of the name Arthur in the Irish Sea area. Well, does that necessarily mean anything? Is the way that names appear in the roster of common names in a certain society, does that happen because of one prominent individual? Or does it happen for some completely different reason? Even if you entertain the notion, as Dorsey Armstrong and others have argued, that these princes were being named after some prominent figure, you still then have to ask, well then, why did that prominent figure have that name? Where did that come from? Again, it can be seen as sort of begging the question. Why do names come about? Why do they appear in the name lexicon? Nicholas Higgum, again, who I'll I'll discuss more in a minute, who wrote a recent book arguing against a historical King Arthur, he simply says, look, this doesn't prove anything. Names come in and out of language groups, not for necessarily for any historical reason. But I think that this is ignoring the point that Dorsey Armstrong made, where she claims that it was particularly common as a pattern to give the name to a crown prince, a person who is going to inherit the throne. And so there's some sort of connection there with command or royalty that needs to be explained. And fifthly, as for the particular candidates, there are problems with each of these possible prototypes for Arthur that, in my view and in the view of many, disqualifies each one of them as eligible for the title of real Arthur or historical Arthur. For the first one, Lucius Artorius Castus, he lived in the Roman period in the second century, and he fought against Picts, not Saxons. So whatever similarities or parallels there might be, he's just far, far off in time and career to qualify as a real King Arthur. The only thing that may be conceivably carried over was perhaps some connection between the name Artorius and riding on horseback. But in my view, that's just not enough. Furthermore, he only lived in Britain for two years before transferring to Dalmatia, where he eventually died. So the whole story that we have that surrounds Arthur of fighting the Saxons, protecting Britain, having a reign of peace and stability, being betrayed and overthrown. All of that is blown away, and there's just too little there linking this historical personage with everything that defines Arthur as we understand him. 
Furthermore, the fact that he was a cavalry officer is irrelevant because the chivalric elements in the Arthur mythos only come in much later, during the Age of Chivalry in the 12th and 13th centuries. Prior to 1100, we have no reference at all connecting Arthur with horses. And even that Otranto mosaic depiction that I referred to before from the 12th century shows him riding on a goat. There's just not enough reason to think that there was any particular connection between Arthur and horsemanship in his own time or for several centuries thereafter. As for the second candidate, Arthur Mac Aidan, he was a Gael, not a Briton. And that right there <laughs> really makes him not Arthur. He was at least a Celt, but he belonged to this Celtic group from Ireland that was coming over the sea and invading and colonizing. So he was a Gael and he fought against Picts, again, like Lucius Artorius Castus. So he does not in any way fit, even if we think there is an Arthur-shaped hole in the history, that hole has to be filled by someone who fought the Anglo-Saxons and halted their westward advance. And Arthur Mac Aidan was simply not that person. And there is no evidence at all of any connection between this Arthur and any specific sites, figures, or stories connected to Arthur. There's just nothing there, again, except the name. And thirdly, as for Riothamus, this leader of Britons who landed in Gaul and tried to fight together in alliance with the Romans. Riothamus maybe is the strongest candidate we can point to, but if it is Riothamus, for one thing, that contradicts the dates found in Annales Cambriae, which put Arthur's career in the early 500s, not back in the 400s, he was simply too early, even for the supposed battle at Mount Baden. Additionally, Nicholas Higgum, in his recent book, King Arthur, The Making of the Legend, he also argues that there is no evidence showing that Riothamus ever even set foot in Great Britain. He is referred to as a leader of Britons, but by this point, by the 6th century, there are a significant number of Britons emigrating and settling down in the western edge of Gaul, in that region that we now know as Brittany. And it makes much more sense that a leader of Britons there on the European continent already would have moved down the coast and tried to join up and support Roman forces in southern Gaul. That would have been a much more feasible undertaking than trying to move forces across the English Channel, which is always difficult and dangerous, as the history of Britain shows. So more likely, he was simply a leader in Brittany, and he maybe was considered a supreme leader or king or chieftain of the Britons in Gaul. So we can't even establish any connection between this man and the island of Great Britain, where all of those battles like Mount Baden took place. So all of these candidates are really just very weak and too far afield to connect with any confidence to the historical King Arthur. Could there maybe be some piece of inspiration or some scrap of raw material here that fed into the legends around King Arthur? Maybe. It's possible. But we can't say that there is any really strong evidence connecting our mythic King Arthur with any recorded historical figure that anyone has found thus far. So that gives you some basic key points in the debate as it has unfolded over the documentary records and references about this supposed person called Arthur. But, as I have referred to repeatedly, there is the matter of archaeology. Archaeology is a field that is growing and advancing technologically, and in recent years has really shaken a lot of historical narratives around the world. How has archaeology affected a historical King Arthur? Has it shed any light? I'm going to go through this you might say, mythogeographic place by place. So if we look at the Arthur cycle, 
as it developed through the Middle Ages. There are a number of key important places connected directly to Arthur in the stories. And there are four in particular that I will pick out, each of which has a different significance for the argument over a historical Arthur. And those four places are Tintagel, the place where he was allegedly conceived and born, Mount Baden, the site of his major military victory, Camelot, his royal court, and Avalon, his place of burial. So let's look at each of these in turn. Firstly, Tintagel. Tintagel is named in Geoffrey of Monmouth's 12th century History of the Kings of Britain as the place where Arthur was conceived by his father, Uther Pendragon, and his mother, the Duchess of Cornwall, and it's at least part of where he grew up. Tintagel is a real place. This is the one and only that (laughs) is totally unambiguous. It is a fortified trading outpost complex on the north coast of Cornwall. And we know, particularly from the pottery remains, that Tintagel was occupied and was an active site of trade in the 5th and 6th centuries. It was possibly the most prosperous and important site, maybe in all of Britain, during the middle of the Dark Age. There are extensive remains of amphorae, large vases and jugs for materials like wine and oil from the Mediterranean world, even as far away as Syria. So it does seem as if it was an active, serious, important site around the time when we might suppose there would have been a historical Arthur. Moreover, in 1998, a very important find was made and that is a single flat stone with a crude inscription on it, which apparently was a kind of rough draft for a formal inscription on a building. And this inscription claims that the building in question, whatever it was, was built by a descendant of Artunu, spelled A-R-T-O-G-N-O-U. And ordinarily... When you see a ruler or a leader referred to as a descendant of such and such person, generally that person is the founder of some kind of ruling dynasty. So this suggests that in the later Dark Age, Tintagel was presided over by rulers who traced their lineage to this personage, Artunu. Is it possible that this person, Artunu, is a prototype of Arthur? of this person who later was called Artus or Arturus. There's even a similarity there in the sounds. Could it be that these names, Arthur and Artunu, are just alternate, maybe Latin and Britonic forms of the same name, or just different pronunciations of the same name? Well, some archaeologists think that there is a link there. Others say, look, close but no cigar. Artunu, maybe it has a syllable in common with Arthur, but it's just not the same name. Furthermore, we should note that if this is true, that there is a connection between this person referred to in the inscription as Artunu and Arthur, then that would throw out all three of the candidate theories that I referred to. (laughs) It's not derived from Riothamus, it's not this guy up in Dalriada, and it's not this Roman general, Lucius Artorius Castus. So is there a real connection here between a historical Arthur and Tintagel? Again, we have a maybe. It's pretty tenuous. There's not much there to go on. But it is more than existed before 1998, at which point we would have had to say, look, there's simply no link at all until Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 1100s, 600 years after Arthur's supposed reign, claims that he was born at Tintagel. Now there is at least some archaeological hint of a real connection. Secondly, Baden, or Mount Baden, which we see referred to in Gildas's history, and then again in Historia Britannum. 
it does seem like there's a pretty good likelihood that there was a real significant battle, possibly between Romano-Britons and Saxons, around the year 500. If we go off of Gildas's history, which does not have precise dates, but he says that Mount Baden, this, this siege of Mount Baden, happened in the year of his birth. And based on the references we have to Gildas, it seems he was born around 500 or so. Well, can we try to locate more precisely in time and space? Where was this supposed Battle of Mount Baden? There are repeated references to Mount Baden in the medieval British records, but they don't give a lot of detail. Gildas, in his Conquest and Ruin of Britain, says that it was a significant victory and it led to something of a brief period of recovery or peace and stability for the Britons in the western part of the island. But he does not mention Arthur or any commander. But in other passages, he says that the main leader of the Celts in this period was someone called Ambrosius Aurelianus which some people then claim that that is the real historical Arthur, but there's nothing else to connect them other than this supposed battle of Mount Baden. Bede, in his Ecclesiastical History of the English People, also refers to the battle at Mount Baden, and he implies that it happened in the 490s. He's not totally clear about it, but he puts it basically in those years just before 500, which more or less lines up with Gildas's claim that the Battle of Mount Baden happened in the year of his birth, which seems, based on what we know about Gildas, was also somewhere around 500. And the Historia Britannum, as I said before, attributes the victory at Mount Baden to, quote, the soldier, Arthur. And it says specifically, quote, the twelfth battle was on Mount Baden, in which there fell in one day 960 men from one charge by Arthur and no one struck them down except Arthur himself. So already it's been turned into this sort of tall tale of extraordinary feat by the fighter Arthur. Well, if we believe this claim in Historia Britannum that Arthur really did win this victory at Baden, it raises the question of why Gildas doesn't mention Arthur and instead only in some other points refers to this guy Ambrosius Aurelianus. Well, in the 12th century, as Arthur's legend was growing and inflating, some religious writers claim that, in fact, Gildas had written about Arthur and had praised him, but then later cut out all those references to Arthur because Arthur killed Gildas's brother, which serves as a convenient explanation for why Arthur's name doesn't appear in Gildas's history. The Annales Cambriae, which was written in Wales in the mid-900s, puts Baden specifically in the year 516. So increasingly it becomes more and more of a serious hardened historical fact. But where is this Baden? And can we find any evidence of what happened in this battle? Well, all through the years people have tried to identify where is Baden, and they often match it up with this or that place name in Britain that seems close, such as, for example, Brayton. But all of these place names were assigned much later and come from Anglo-Saxon origins and probably have no relation to what Romano-Britons in the 500s would have called this or that hill or mountain. Geoffrey of Monmouth, in his mammoth history of the kings of Britain in the 1130s, where he really blows up the story of Arthur as this conquering king and emperor, he identifies Baden as Bath, and he claims that the town of Bath was besieged by Saxons and was on the point of being captured until Arthur and his men arrive and save Baden. So this seems to make sense. We know that Bath is a very ancient town that goes back to the Roman era. It probably continued to be a significant town in the Dark Age, And it would have naturally been a target for Saxons as they advanced westward across the southern part of Britain. So we can see where Geoffrey of Monmouth's story here seems to make sense, that Baden is Bath. But there are major issues, linguistic issues, with this claim. Bath is an Anglo-Saxon name. It comes from Germanic roots, 
and it means bath. Naturally enough, speakers of Anglo-Saxon simply called this town with baths and hot springs Bath. Romano-Britons didn't call the town Bath, they called it Aque Sulis. And there's no apparent reason why Gildas, writing back in the 500s in Latin, who despised the Anglo-Saxons, why he would have used the Anglo-Saxon name to refer to this town rather than Aque Sulis or some other Romano-British name. It doesn't make sense. You know, the only conceivable reason that might have happened is maybe if the town had been conquered by Anglo-Saxons and occupied and renamed with this Anglo-Saxon name. But according to Gildas himself, that didn't happen. The Saxons were defeated and had to fall back. So it really doesn't make sense historically why Bath would have been called Baden or anything like that back in the 6th century. And this was probably just a conveniently matched up identification for Geoffrey of Monmouth. So Baden remains probably the most mysterious supposed site connected with Arthur. Another mysterious one, but where some possible progress has maybe been made, is Camelot. So Camelot is first mentioned in connection with Arthur in Chrétien de Troyes' poems in the late 1100s, where he says that on one particular day, Arthur held court as befits a king at Camelot. Did he have some knowledge or information connecting Arthur to this place, or did he just make it up? Maybe it was just a word he conveniently cobbled together from cam, a Celtic root often associated with royalty, and lot, just meaning place or area. Furthermore, as I mentioned last time, the word also happens to rhyme. It fits into the rhyme scheme of the poem. So maybe it's just his little invention that then got blown up as the name of a supposed splendorous court. Also, in addition to that, there are different early manuscripts of these poems by Chrétien de Troyes, and they're not all identical. There are variations. And some of the early manuscripts in that line, instead of Camelot, they say Con lui plo, which is a French phrase meaning as he pleased. So in that case, maybe what the line was originally saying as Chrétien composed it was simply he held court where he wanted as he wanted. And perhaps this name Camelot actually originated as a mishearing of what some bards or minstrels were saying or singing as they recited this poem. And hence, this title and this notion of a, a specific location of Arthur's court just originated from a misunderstanding, which is not unusual. But if we put that aside and say, no, Chrétien de Troyes had some information passed down through lore or lost records locating Arthur's capital at Camelot, well then where could this be? Well, most authors of Arthur romances, it seems, just assumed that Camelot was the same place as some other royal court or capital that they already knew about. And readers and followers of Chrétien de Troyes apparently assumed that Camelot was the same place as Caerleon in Wales, a later royal capital in Wales. It just seemed to make sense. Others later, like Thomas Mallory, assumed that it was Winchester, a town in southern England that was a traditional center of royal authority. And it seems some English monarchs agreed with this assumption, and the Plantagenet rulers actually commissioned a round table and other Arthurian artifacts and accoutrements for their court at Winchester, figuring that that was the latter-day Camelot. But Renaissance scholars, beginning in the 1500s, were not satisfied with this because they found no particular evidence linking any of these towns with a Dark Age royal court. So people have tried to maybe identify Camelot with other places around Britain, such as Colchester or Chester or other Roman forts around Britain, usually, again, going on similarities in the place name, right? You start 
by opening the gazetteer and looking under the letter C and seeing what seems close enough. And in most cases, there's really nothing to connect these various places to a supposed Dark Age capital. But there's one possible exception that maybe has a little bit more significance, and that is a site in the southwest of England, near the town of Cadbury in Somerset. So in the early 1500s, an antiquary named John Leland, who was patronized by Henry VIII and who was a Renaissance humanist, who was interested in tracing out and discovering the earliest possible verifying evidence about historical legends. John Leland wanted to uncover. He might have been, you could say, the first quester for the historical Arthur. He wanted to find the real sites and events of Arthur's career. And he went searching for Camelot, and he noted two towns, small villages, close to each other in Somerset, each of which has the word camel in its name, West Camel and Queen Camel. And he theorized that these villages might be connected to some kind of royal site, going back to the pre-Anglo-Saxon age. Cam, as I said, has this royal significance, and specifically Queen Camel suggests that maybe there was some royal court there or nearby. So Leland looked around these towns in Somerset, near Cadbury, and he found that the local people in the area pointed to South Cadbury Hill Fort, a large, terraced, apparently fortified hill south of Cadbury that very likely was the site of an Iron Age hill fort dating back to before the Roman era, 2,000 and more years ago. So one could look at South Cadbury Hill and say, well, this is just another Iron Age hill fort like any number of others around Britain. But the local people claimed that they had found various important artifacts around the area, many Roman coins and other strange and unfamiliar antiquities. And they commonly called it Camalate, something very close to Camelot, and that, in Leland's words, Arthur resorted there often. So they don't exactly claim that it is a palace or necessarily a capital, but that it was connected in some way with Arthur's activities. So Leland is the first to float this idea that what seems to be an Iron Age hill fort was in fact occupied and used for centuries after, including during the Arthur period. Nothing very systematic was done with this information until the 1960s when archaeologists began excavating. And in fact, they found foundations of very large palisades fortifying the entire perimeter of the hilltop and a very large, strong gatehouse that would have controlled the entranceway into this palisaded enclosure. They also found very rich remains of pottery coming from the Mediterranean, just like at Tintagel. And it seems that there was trade and travel connecting this site on South Cadbury Hill to this larger Mediterranean and European world, just the same as there was at Tintagel in the same period. The fortifications around South Cadbury Hill would have required at least 800 people to man these walls effectively. There's about a mile total of wall surrounding this hilltop, and it clearly had to be a major site supported by a lot of population and money and trade and power in the late 400s and early 500s. So critics will point out this is not a unique hill fort from this period. There are many cases where it seems that old Iron Age hill forts were reoccupied and refortified during the Dark Age after the Roman withdrawal. And it's possible that the story, the figure of Arthur, was simply retroactively applied to this particular one by the 1500s. This could be folkloric, fantastical history. But it is significant that this particular hill fort is really unusual in size, in apparent power, and prosperity. And it does make sense. This archaeology does seem to corroborate the oral histories of 
of the local people, at least insofar as supporting the idea that this was a particularly important hill fort in the Dark Age. So the final site related to Arthur that is probably the most complex and the most contentious is Avalon, this mystical island which was supposedly his resting place. The name of Avalon probably derives from Celtic words meaning the Isle of Apples, and the idea of Arthur being carried there in his last moments is consistent with this long-running belief in islands as kind of holy sanctuaries, separated from the ordinary world. Now, naturally, people have looked for many years for islands around the coastlines of Wales or Cornwall or Brittany for places that could maybe match to this story of Avalon. But actually, the site that has attracted the most interest and been identified and debated as the possible location of Avalon is Glastonbury Tor, a large steep hill in Somerset in southwestern England, which is not on the coast at all and does not seem to be an island. However, it is surrounded by low flat lands, mostly below sea level, that sometimes flood during heavy precipitation, like in the winter and spring, And it seems that in the Middle Ages, before the 14th century, there actually was a lot of marshy fenland surrounding Glastonbury Tor, such that it was probably an island most of the time, and a difficult-to-access one, because you had to somehow get a boat through these wetlands. And you can imagine this very steep peaked hill rising out of the plains, surrounded by the mists of these marshes in the early mornings. It's easy to imagine why ancient or medieval people might have seen it as a kind of holy or otherworldly place. Now, is there anything archaeological actually connecting Glastonbury to Avalon? Well, for one thing, in 1998, in the same year that archaeologists found this Artognu stone in Tintagel, another team was also excavating at the foot of South Cadbury Hill in Somerset, this site that many people identify as Camelot. And at the foot of the hill, they found a very ancient Bronze Age burial, which seems to be of a warrior, a prominent person, who was laid out lying supine in a large wooden boat. And this seems to resonate with stories of souls being carried across a waterway to a far land or an island that represents the world of the dead. You can think of stories like the River Styx in Greek mythology. Well, this particular boat burial is pointed away from South Cadbury Hill, and the prow of the boat is directed straight towards Glastonbury Tor, which is on the horizon 10 miles away, as if the warrior is being set off in his ship to cross those fenlands and reach some sort of island or world of the dead at Glastonbury Tor. So there's plenty of reason to think that Glastonbury could have been considered a sort of holy place, a place of the dead or ancestors. But is there anything specifically connecting it to Arthur other than the similarity to that story of Arthur being carried by boat to Avalon? Well, in 1191, centuries earlier, more than 800 years prior, the monks at Glastonbury Abbey, the monastery in the town of Glastonbury, next to Glastonbury Tor, made an entry in their annals where they claimed that they had dug and excavated at a site on the grounds of the abbey and found a tomb with the remains of a large man and a woman who had been enclosed in a large wooden coffin inside this tomb. And furthermore, they claimed that with these remains, they also found a lead cross with an inscription in it in sort of crude, simplistic Latin, which read, translated into English, quote, Here lies buried the renowned King Arthur with Guinevere, his second wife, in the Isle of Avalon. So this lead cross is now lost. It was discarded or perhaps destroyed 
in the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1500s. We do know that it did really exist prior to being lost. Many visitors to Glastonbury record seeing it, described it, and some even made drawings of it, which are fairly consistent. So it was a real object. The question is, was it authentic or a forgery? And was it really found in this tomb underneath the grounds of Glastonbury Abbey, as the monks claimed in their annals? Well, most scholars tend to simply dismiss this whole story out of hand as bogus. For one thing, abbeys liked to promote themselves as sites of pilgrimage. It could bring them fame, alms and offerings, and donations. It was a way to make money. Arthur was becoming an increasingly popular figure at this time in the 1100s. This could attract attention, put Glastonbury on the map, and also it could curry royal favor. The king, Henry II, this Plantagenet king that I've spoken about before, he really liked to connect himself to Arthur and to derive some of that legitimacy from Arthur. So there was plenty of motive for the monks to make up this story and to plant a false archaeological find. But there are some who still argue in favor of the authenticity of this supposed discovery. Dorsey Armstrong at Purdue, whom I've mentioned before, she defends the authenticity of it. She points out that the monks actually didn't promote and advertise this find. They didn't make money from it. We only know of it because it was recorded in the annals of the monastery and later visitors eventually over the years remarked seeing this lead cross. So it doesn't seem that they particularly exploited it. She also argues that the writing style and spelling of the inscription seem to be correct to the Dark Age, including in particular the name, which is recorded as Arturius, A-R-T-U-R-I-U-S. So this does not fit with later medieval references to Arthur as Artus or Arturus, like you see in those inscriptions in Italy, for instance. And rather, it makes sense as an earlier form of the name, which was still evolving from its earlier Latin prototype, Artorius. It's maybe just one step removed. So etymologically, the way the name is written seems to fit with it being authentic. Also, as Armstrong points out, the burial coffin is described by the monks as a hollowed out tree trunk, probably a big oak trunk. And that also seems to be consistent with archaeology from both Iron Age, pre-Roman and sub-Roman burials. So there are points to be made on both sides of whether to take this supposed find from 1191 seriously. But personally, I think there are two aspects of that Latin inscription that leap out to me as big problems and cast doubt, in my mind, on the authenticity. For one, the reference to Arthur as Rex Arturius, King Arthur. As I said before in my first lecture on Arthur, there are no surviving documents from earlier than the year 1000 that make any reference to Arthur being a king. And there are early ones, such as the passage in Historia Britannum, that seem to specifically say he was not a king. Historia Britannum says he fought with the kings of Britons, but he himself was a war commander. So referring to Arthur as Rex in this inscription seems highly dubious and very likely to be a later forgery back projecting the notion of Arthur as a king, which was accepted in the later Middle Ages, back projecting it back into Arthur's time. The other aspect of the inscription that really raises doubt in my mind is the ending, where it says, in the Isle of Avalon. Have you ever seen an epitaph or inscription that specifically makes note of where it is. <laughs> Have you ever gone to, let's say, Thomas Jefferson's grave marker, and it says, here lies Thomas Jefferson in Monticello in Virginia? It's totally redundant and useless in a real inscription, and there doesn't seem to be any reason to add it on there unless the author 
is insistent on connecting that location to Avalon and is trying to prove that Glastonbury is Avalon. So I think that casts more doubt on its authenticity and makes it seem more like a piece of convenient propaganda. So if we put aside these archaeological sites and the possibilities that they might offer some connection to Arthur, let's then sum up the basic current state of the dispute. So most scholars today tend to cluster around the view that Arthur is purely a figure of legend and folklore who should not be regarded as having any historical basis. And the argument against the historical Arthur was summed up most recently in the book King Arthur, The Making of the Legend, published just two years ago by Higgum. And Higgum argues that Arthur is basically a political fabrication. The earliest written references to him are all weak or vague and come much too late to have any historical veracity. And he believes the big watershed moment in the development of the Arthur myth is Geoffrey of Monmouth's book, Historia Regum Britanniae, from 1136, which is the first to put forward a narrative of Arthur as a king of the entire island of Great Britain who went abroad and made conquests. So in Higgum's view, all the later stories and romances about Arthur, like Chrétien de Troyes and the Vulgate Cycle and Thomas Mallory's Les Mortes d'Arthur should all be seen as kind of imaginative, fabulous embellishments and elaborations on the basic narrative in Geoffrey of Monmouth's book, and hence they have no historical value. They cannot tell us anything about what was said or known about Arthur prior to 1136 and Geoffrey of Monmouth's text. Camelot, the Knights of the Round Table, the Holy Grail, all of this has to be thrown into the bin of unreliable legends and tall tales. So considering all of the evidence, is this the strongest explanation? Is it true that everything said and written about Arthur after 1136, after Geoffrey of Monmouth, is just bunk or is just fiction and fantasy? Is there no possible historical factual value to any of them? Well, to answer that question, we have to consider whether there could be other sources for those stories and claims about Arthur other than Geoffrey of Monmouth. Is there anything connecting us further back in time to some other source of knowledge? Well, some medieval writers clearly were drawing on something else and particularly Marie de France, who wrote two lays dealing with Arthur, specifically said that her source for her stories was Breton bards, these traveling poet, musician, storytellers. These Breton bards, I mentioned them before in discussing how stories of Arthur could have gotten from Brittany to Italy. They are, you might say, the big black box. We know very little about them, We know almost nothing about what they said. We can only infer things indirectly from documents or images. We know much less about their songs and poems than we do about the Welsh bards. But how do their stories and tales of Arthur compare to what the Welsh were saying? We really don't know. Could they have propagated some stories or claims about Arthur and his era with some historical basis apart from Geoffrey of Monmouth. If we're to entertain the historicist hypothesis, the idea that there is some sort of specific person who gave rise to the Arthur legends, then those Breton bards are critical. They have to carry a lot of the weight, and they have to be most of the explanation of how those facts eventually reached the writers of these medieval romances. And whether you consider this plausible or give it any credence depends a lot on how you evaluate lore and oral traditions. Do oral traditions provide any sort of reliable facts? Can they be taken seriously apart from written corroboration? Well, as I've said before many times in other lectures, 
very often we see oral traditions that had been dismissed as mere folklore and legend getting corroboration and turning out to have a great deal more veracity than it seemed. There are many examples of this, but one big early example was the discovery of Troy in the year 1870 when the German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann went to Asia Minor in search of the remains of Troy, a city that no one knew existed apart from Homer's epics about the Trojan War and which was generally treated as just a piece of literary fiction. But he took a leap of faith and believed he could find the legendary Troy, and he succeeded and found the remains and foundations of a large city, basically where you would expect it to be based on the clues in the Iliad, and it clearly had been destroyed by war, probably more than once. So this, of course, doesn't mean that the whole mythology about Helen of Troy and Paris and Priam and Hector and Odysseus is all true, but it does mean that there's at least some underlying grain of real fact that can be matched up where the the oral tradition, and that's how Homer's epics began, as orally recited epic poems, and the archaeology come together. And there are many other examples of this. Uh, You can point to the Tel Dan Stele in Israel-Palestine, which corroborated the existence of a ruler named David, That doesn't mean that everything said about David in the Bible is true, but there is at least corroboration on that basic point. There are examples within Britain, too. Not long ago, the British television show Time Team, which records archaeological excavations around Britain, went to a hilltop in Somerset in that same region of southwestern England, which local oral tradition claimed was the site of a medieval castle, although you couldn't see any sign or remains of it at all on this hilltop. But they excavated, and indeed, they found the foundations of a large Norman stone keep. And it had been built, probably never finished, and then finally dismantled and demolished in the 1200s. So somehow the brief existence of this castle keep on this hilltop had been preserved and passed on for 800 years until archaeologists came along to substantiate it. And there are other examples connected to famous historical events. You might remember a few years ago the discovery of the remains of Richard III under a car park in Leicester in the middle of England. The location where they could search for Richard's remains was based on a written document from close to the time. So that did not come from the oral tradition. But there were bardic poems and songs from the Battle of Bosworth Field when Richard III was defeated. And one of them specifically described how his opponents were able to approach him and swing and strike him on the head with a halberd, a sort of large axe-like blade weapon, which sliced off the back part of his head. And once his remains were discovered, they were able to verify that is indeed exactly how he was killed. And that specific fact was successfully preserved in that bardic poem for hundreds of years. There are other instances, too, where oral traditions can be corroborated by other oral traditions independent attestations of the same sort of event. And an interesting example of this is the historian Andrew Newman examined the oral histories among the Lenape Delaware Indians about their encounters with the Dutch explorer Henry Hudson. And they claim that Hudson and his Dutch sailors played a trick involving an ox hide. I won't get into the deep details but played a sort of wily trick to persuade them to cede a small piece of land on which they could then build an outpost and thus create their first colonial foothold in what's now Manhattan. Well, for centuries, this oral history was treated as simply historically worthless folklore, and it was pointed out that the story mimics a similar episode in the Aeneid, that ancient Roman epic, where Queen Dido plays the same trick on local people, and that allows her to found the city of Carthage. So it was easy to just dismiss this as a folktale, 
But Andrew Newman combed through the oral histories from various other indigenous peoples around the world and found that several of them told the same story of Portuguese or Dutch mariners playing this specific trick on them as a way of getting a small plot of land in southern Africa, in Indonesia, in the Philippines. So in this way, oral histories that might seem highly dubious can actually be corroborated by other oral histories or by archaeological evidence or visual evidence any number of ways. And specifically, in many of these instances, when we're talking about bardic poems or passages in the Bible or the Odyssey and the Iliad, oral histories that are composed in verse seem to have a remarkable staying power. Verse is intended to be memorized and recited from memory word for word. And it seems that histories in verse can be passed on for centuries and preserve at least some bits of factual information In this light, when we look at the bardic poetic tradition that propagated stories about Arthur, we have to, I think, at least consider the possibility that there's some information there that might have some historical plausibility. Of course, it can be very tempting then to use this as a sort of crutch or convenient excuse to believe that the Arthur canon has historical truth to it because it's so much more exciting and romantic to think that these events really happened and that there really was a Camelot, we shouldn't overuse this link through the bardic tradition. But we do have to recognize that there may be some value there. And at the very least, at the least, there is some other source that was available there for romance writers to draw upon other than just Geoffrey of Monmouth's book. So Higgum, like many academic historians, tends to focus very narrowly on textual sources and to ignore both oral and also visual sources. And he does not consider crucial pieces of evidence that I started off with in my first lecture about King Arthur. So we're going to sort of come full circle back to those earliest known visual representations of Arthur, which I think are actually crucial to this question. The first one, chronologically, is the Modena architrave, the decorated carved stone archway over an entranceway to the cathedral at Modena in northern Italy, which shows a scene with Artus and other knights rescuing Guinevere from a tower. And the second one, from a few decades later, is the mosaic floor in the Cathedral of Otranto in southern Italy, which shows a figure labeled as Rex Arturus, King Arthur, riding on a goat. These two visual depictions of Arthur, if you want to call them that, demonstrate the circulation of stories and claims about Arthur in the 12th century, completely independent of Geoffrey of Monmouth and History of the Kings of Britain. How do we know that? Well, firstly, the Modena architrave shows an episode which does not appear at all in Geoffrey of Monmouth's book, but it does appear in a revised form in Chrétien de Troyes' poem from a little bit later in the 1100s, where we have the character of Lancelot riding in and rescuing Guinevere from the tower. So, It appears that there was an oral tradition or maybe a lost written tradition that brought the knowledge or claim of this episode from Brittany into Italy that the artists in that church in Modena drew upon, and also so did Chrétien de Troyes. And it's completely separate from Geoffrey of Monmouth and these Latin histories written in Britain. As for the Otranto mosaic, we see there Arthur doing battle with Kothpalug, the giant cat that eventually killed and and replaced him. And Kothpalug is discussed in the Welsh bardic literature. Again, not in Geoffrey of Monmouth. It's a completely different kind of episode. So we can see there was the circulation of some independent body of lore and narratives about Arthur, 
most likely spread by Bretons, maybe by bards and minstrels or others, maybe knights, servants, who traveled through France and Italy during the Crusades. And we have reason to believe that this body of oral testimony about Arthur was drawn upon by both Marie de France and Chrétien de Troyes, two of the major Arthurian romance authors that we know of. And if we go back to Glastonbury, this possible site of Avalon, the monks in their annals claim that they knew where to dig, where to target to look for the gravesite of Arthur, because it was pointed out to them by a Breton minstrel, of which there were a number after the Norman conquest of England. So we don't know if that's true. It could all be a hoax. But at the very least, the notion that Glastonbury was Avalon and that this was a place where you could find the remains of Arthur may have been transmitted again by these Breton bards and their oral tradition. So Higgum and other historians like him are very narrowly focused on textual evidence produced within Britain in Latin and Welsh, and they ignore the role of these Breton sources Due to all of these epistemic biases, they just drop them out of the picture, where they clearly have to serve as some kind of link explaining where Arthur legends came from and how they developed. Interestingly, Nicholas Higgum, when he's discussing possible candidates for the historical Arthur and debunking them, he comes to Riothamus, this leader or commander of Britons who supposedly fought against Goths in Gaul, according to Jordanus. He dismisses Riothamus as a candidate because he says there's no evidence that Riothamus was ever in Great Britain. He probably was just a leader in Brittany of Britons who had emigrated to Brittany, and it would have been much more feasible and plausible for a leader in Brittany in that corner of Gaul to then get involved in those wars, rather than having to make the dangerous and difficult crossing of the channel. But then we have to ask, well, does that necessarily mean that he can't be a prototype for Arthur? If so many of these claims and stories about Arthur that persisted and spread in the High Middle Ages were coming from Bretons, is it inconceivable that That maybe is where the story really originated, and that the historical Arthur was in Brittany, not in Great Britain, and that he was only moved back across the channel, you might say, in later years. Certainly not a possibility that Higgum entertains for a moment. And because Higgum ignores the links connecting to these Breton bards and the stories that they were propagating, He makes the mistake repeatedly of assuming that when a claim about Arthur first appears in writing, that must be when it was first invented, as if there were no oral sources providing material for these texts. And if, say, for instance, Chrétien de Troyes is the first to mention Camelot, that means he must have picked it out of thin air. He must have invented it. And he doesn't consider what what these authors might have been drawing upon. Instead, he just assumes that it's all based upon the template of Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain. Now, as I said, the Breton bards, as of now at least, are basically a black box. We really don't know what they were saying or why. We know even less about them than we know about the Welsh bards. Is there any way to fill in that blank? How can we possibly find out what they were up to and what they were saying and where their information might have been coming from? Well, as we can already see, what little we know or what little we can theorize about the stories that these Breton bards told comes not from texts or not mainly from texts. It comes from these two pieces of visual evidence from Italy. And one of these, at least, the Modena architrave, was only noted by scholars and connected to King Arthur in the 19th century when someone pointed out, hey, there's this carving over this entranceway in Modena that refers to Artus de Britannia. So we have to ask, could there be more material 
out there that also represents something of the matter of Britain as it was told and understood in the Middle Ages, where could it be? Maybe is there more in Italy? Maybe is there more beyond Italy? Possibly all around Europe? Maybe in the Holy Land where a lot of these crusaders were going? It seems possible. Has anyone investigated? And how difficult might it be to locate that evidence if probably most of it isn't labeled. You know, we have identified and been able to discuss the Modena architrave and the Arthur figure in the Otranto mosaic because they're very conveniently labeled. Here he is, Arthur. (laughs) Is there more out there representing Arthur or other figures or episodes in the matter of Britain that just hasn't been located and examined? With all of those considerations in mind, Let's get down to two last concluding questions. One, what can we plausibly say about a historical Arthur, if he did exist at all? And two, what exactly would count as a historical Arthur? How close to the stories and legends does this historical personage have to be to even be worthy of the name historical Arthur? So as for the first question, what is there left that we can say with confidence about the real King Arthur? Well, I have taken 17 statements or claims about the figure of King Arthur, and I've ranked them in order of likeliness according to my best guesses based on everything we've seen. So I start off with one statement that I think seems to be more likely than not true. That I would say, although it's uncertain, I would tend to put my money on this being accurate, and then I've ranked 16 other statements in order from more to less likely. So what is the one thing that I would say is probably factual? There was a Romano-British military leader called Arthur. That's basically it. He was a fighter of some sort, He had a name, something like Arthur, and his career was in that sub-Roman period of contention between Celts and Saxons. That's it. We can't even say with any confidence when or where he fought or how. Next, there are two statements that I think at least seem to have a reasonable probability, worth at least about a 50-50 wager. And those are number two, Arthur won battles against Saxons, including a victory at a place called Mount Baden. Where is Mount Baden? We just don't know. And three, Arthur was a Christian. It makes sense in the context of the time, and the earliest accounts of his career say that he fought battles bearing Christian emblems, which makes sense facing off against pagan Germanic opponents. Then there are several that seem to at least have a substantial possibility, but I wouldn't say rise to the level of 50-50, are pretty doubtful. And those are four, Arthur led a circle of fighters, or Teulu, as it would be called in Welsh. Seems possible. We don't know how Romanized he was or was not. Number five, Arthur helped to unify Celtic Britons and halt the Saxon advance, leading to a period of stability. Later documents from the Middle Ages describe Arthur as a leader in those terms, but it doesn't seem too likely that that's really how it happened at the time. And six, Arthur was displaced or overthrown by a follower or kinsman called Mordred. And this is one that also only shows up in documents from hundreds of years later, including the Annales Cambriae, which describes him being defeated and overthrown at Camlan. But it's interesting that the name Mordred appears more than once, and there is a consistency, at least from that time onward. So maybe it's possible that that's a fact that was transmitted and eventually put down in writing. Then there are those for which there's only a small possibility. I would really put no weight on them, but it's plausible. Number seven, the warriors around Arthur included ones called Kay and Bedivere. Those are the earliest individuals connected with Arthur, other than Mordred. All the other knights come from much later. And number eight, Arthur had a sword called something like Califern or Caliburnus, 
which represented his authority. This would not have been unusual. Swords were named. That seems to be a common practice. And this title for Arthur's sword goes back into very early records. And of course, it was later changed by Wace into Excalibur. So maybe that traces back to an actual fact. So those that seem pretty unlikely because they don't appear in the earliest records when it seems as if they should have, if they are factual, and hence seem very improbable. Number nine, Arthur held a court at a hilltop fort called Camelot. Number 10, Arthur had a wife called Guinevere. Number 11, Arthur had a round table for his followers. And number 12, Arthur was buried at Glastonbury. There is no evidence for any of those claims from earlier than about 1100, with the exception of Guinevere and Avalon being at Glastonbury, but those are only corroborated by that lead cross, which is of highly dubious authenticity. One that is very unlikely, that more even than those others seems as if it almost surely couldn't be true, because it would have been attested in earlier records. And that is number 13, Arthur was a king. There's just no reference at all to Arthur being a king, having that position or title, from any earlier than 1,000, so about 500 years after his supposed reign. It's just not believable. Again, the only possible piece of evidence for that is the lead cross, and it simply stands out as incongruous with everything else that's said in the early references to Arthur, particularly the Historia Britannum, which is the first document we found that describes Arthur's career, and it specifically says, he fought with kings of Britons, but he himself was Dukes Bellorum war commander, as if to specifically point out he was not a king. And then those that are almost certainly false, that are simply contradicted by other evidence and what we know about the context of the sub-Roman age. So these last four, I would say, are basically disproved. Number 14, Arthur's followers were knights. Knighthood, chivalry, those are concepts of the High Middle Ages. They simply have no meaning when we're talking about the sub-Roman age. Fifteen, these knights sought the Holy Grail. All the characters that are described as seeking the Holy Grail, like Lancelot, Percival, Gawain, Galahad, all of these were either made up or plucked out of folklore and stuck down at Arthur's round table in the High Middle Ages during this period of Arthur romances. Either they're completely fake and made up, or they're based on people who had no prior connection to Arthur. The same is true of number 16. Arthur was associated with a sorcerer called Merlin. Merlin very likely is inspired by a real person, the Welsh bard Myrden, who is very admired. But Myrden is discussed in many documents for hundreds of years, totally independent and separate of Arthur no claim of any connection between them until the 12th and 13th centuries, where people are trying to build up sorcery and magic around Arthur, and Geoffrey of Monmouth is the first to stick Arthur with Merlin. So this is the same sort of thing that's happened with other folkloric characters like Robin Hood and Maiden Marian, who were separate characters with separate stories and plays around them before they were then eventually combined together into, you might say, the same universe. Lastly, number 17, Arthur had an opponent called Morgan Le Fay. Morgan Le Fay also only appears in Arthurian legends in the 1200s. Maybe she existed earlier in Welsh or Breton folklore, but she had no connection to Arthur before that time, and she serves a very convenient literary purpose of sort of providing Arthur's evil mirror image and nemesis. So if all of these later associations with Arthur, like most of the Knights of the Round Table, the Holy Grail, probably even Camelot and Guinevere, if these are all either fictions or only later connected to Arthur, then we have to ask, well, 
if the only thing that seems likely to be true is that there was somebody called Arthur who was some sort of military leader in the sub-Roman age, can we actually call that person the historical King Arthur? What actually counts as the historical King Arthur? And is it maybe misleading, even if there was that basic germ of a story, is it maybe misleading to say that was a historical King Arthur? Because it seems then to lend veracity to this whole complicated and developed set of associations around Arthur. And if we want an Arthur that is worthy of the name, you might say, and that underpins this massive, rich, mythic cycle, maybe we have to say he's really a composite figure, that probably a lot of these stories and episodes that circulated around Arthur, including in that Breton bardic tradition, probably came some from mythology and folklore and some from real historical events. And maybe some of these involved various, any number of minor warlord chieftains in sub-Roman Britain. Maybe some of them really stemmed not from the this particular putative Arthur, but maybe from other Arthurs, maybe from these later princes like Arthur Mac Aidan in Dalrida and their deeds and adventures. And in this way, maybe you can see Arthur not as a real person that got mythologized, but rather as a mythic figure that embodies and gathers together all the mythology, all the ideas, images, stories relating to the Dark Age that people found valuable and that in many cases people still find valuable and appealing and that have been kind of combined together into this one overarching myth that stands in for everything we remember or know or imagine about the Dark Age.